thank you for coming to Platanos. It's a pleasure having you in Naples. What do you think of um, of Naples? Is it your first time here? My first visit uh, will not be my last. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really enjoyed it. The climate reminds me of where I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Um, the architecture is nothing like Los Angeles. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Every street has new wonders to behold. And of course, the food is bellissimo. Okay. <laughs> and the drinks, especially here at Platanos, make me very happy. You have a long story. We've learned to know you as a kind of Indiana Jones of uh, rums or uh, the perfect barfly of tiki bars. <laughs> now, lots of years have passed. Obviously, the, the, the beard has got whiter. How do you define yourself today? A very lucky bum, basically. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said there's no second act in American life, but because of the whole tiki revival, I actually got one. Um, you know, I never saw it coming. I always thought that I was researching these recipes and making these drinks for myself in a small circle of friends, and then all of a sudden it becomes a global phenomenon. And for the one and only time in my life, I'm in the right place at the right time. So. But very fortunate. Very fortunate indeed. You said you've written, and you discovered lots of things about tiki. It took a long time to discover and collect all the material. What is there still to discover today about tiki and exotic cocktails? I don't really think there are any new horizons as far as doing historical research. There are a handful of Don the Beachcomber recipes that we don't have yet. And I'm sure there are still some people who work for him who are alive today who would have interesting stories to tell. But by and large, um, his canon, his, his most famous recipes have all been uh, excavated. I think what's interesting now about Tiki is the direction that it's being taken in by different bartenders in different countries around the world, all bringing their own cultural perspectives to it and doing this kind of uh, mashup of their own native culture and this strange American mid-century um, version of Polynesian culture. So it's uh, very interesting to see that. I'm, I'm glad you say that because a debate today is that Tiki has been like um, rediscovered and it's kind of stopped. It had a beginning and an end. Tiki bars today, are they from are there bars that are strictly from that period, or are they going to always be evolving? In 50 years, what will Tiki be? Uh, well, if I'm still alive in 50 years, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> it'll be very interesting to see. I don't know. I can't predict it. Um, I could not have predicted the directions Tiki went in just in this decade. Um, you have all kinds of strange hybrids of the original American concept, um, some of them really good. But it, it, um, I think what will be really interesting is to see how far the concept can be stretched to fit uh, other people's kind of bars. Like what you have now, more than devoted tiki bars which do the decor, which do a full tiki menu, which try to provide that little mini vacation, that escape, that uh, what made the bars famous in the first place in the mid 20th century. In the 21st century, what you have are non-tiki bars serving tiki drinks. Um, many of them craft cocktail bars. Uh, many of them self-described dive bars. This, uh, especially in New York City, there's this phenomenon of the tiki dive bar, mm. which um, is depending on how you look at it, either a tremendous cheat... Can I just talk to you? Dive bar yeah. is something that difficult to translate. It's kind of... Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. give you a definition of dive yeah. bar. Um, in America, um, there are several different kinds of bars traditionally from the beginning of the country. Um, well, at least from the beginning of the mid-19th century. You have high-end hotel bars, which are meant for business travelers with money, and they're very elegant um, and you know dark, uh, well appointed, well furnished. Um, you have um, restaurant bars, which can be anything from a white tablecloth fine dining uh, bar, which you just have a drink in while you're waiting to be escorted to the dining room. Again, a sort of a high end, refined experience. And then you have um, what we in America call the dive bar. Um, we, called it, we call it a dive bar now 
Um, but what it used to be called was just a neighborhood bar. Okay. Um, the decor, if there was any, was just whatever bric-a-brac people brought, regulars bought in and they put it behind the bar. You know, um, um, not much to speak of in the way of looks. Um, cheap drinks. Good um, hospitality. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not necessarily, well, but there are places. Sometimes bad hospitality is a good trademark, also. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the experience was the exact opposite of restaurant bars and hotel bars, which catered to um, you know a money crowd. Dive bars or neighborhood bars, if you will, um, catered to uh, people with limited means, um, with a limited experience of the cocktail world. You didn't go to a dive bar for a cocktail. Many times if you went to a dive bar for a cocktail, say in the 1980s or 90s, they'd throw you out. You know, what we'll just give you what do you what what do you want in the shot glass? It's a beer and a shot. Dive bars are beer and a shot bars. It's like um, uh, you got a shot of whiskey, you got a beer, um, anything more complicated than that, um, if you wanted a pina colada and they had a bottle of pina colada mix, okay, they just pour that in a glass with some but it, it, you didn't go there for cocktails necessarily. Um, and you weren't self-conscious about being in a um, sort of like a, let me rephrase this. You weren't conscious of the fact that you were in a dive bar. You, you had no irony about it. You had no, it wasn't kitsch or camp. It was just you were in a low rent neighborhood beer and shop bar. Now, in the 21st century, the concept has become very self-aware and very ironic and uh, kitschy or campy. Oh, we're going to go slumming. We're going to go to this like really low rent neighborhood bar with some grouchy guy behind the bar and he's going to treat us badly and it's kind of cool, you know. So what's happened is that has become cloned into an artificial experience. No owner of a dive bar would ever refer to his own bar as a dive bar. Okay. Um, he or she would never do that. It's like, what are you talking about? They would be insulted, um, but the idea now of the sort of hipster dive bar is a very self-aware, very self-reflexive, meta kind of bar. Like you're referencing a low-rent slummy bar, but you're not really one. Um, a true dive bar has acquired character over many decades and generations. Um, a fake dive bar tries to do that, you know, a week after opening and create a false experience. And in a way, it's not unlike a tiki bar. What? Creating a false Polynesian. Mistake, you know? mistake me if I'm wrong. Our dive bars were the last sort of bar that kept tiki alive for the last years because restaurants and the kind of high-end tiki were the first to go away. What, what kept it alive, that little flame? Well, actually it was not dive bars, um, which were always non-cocktail bars. Um, you would never think of going to a dive bar and ordering um, a Navy Grog or a Scorpion. That was, you go to a tiki bar mm. for that. Now, there were neighborhood tiki bars, uh, dedicated tiki bars. Like the, the, the one that I went to, I was a regular at the Tiki Tea in Hollywood. It's opened in 1961. It surfed the wave of popularity. And when the bottom dropped out of tiki and it became uncool and places closed down all over the place, the Tiki Tea survived survived because it was a neighborhood bar and the clientele were just people who lived in that neighborhood who went to that bar and it just happened to serve tiki drinks and happened to be a tiki bar so the lower end tiki places um, were the ones that survived into and some of them were lucky enough to survive into the renaissance now the tiki tea is like a hip and cool place to go again with a line around the door you know so. One of the things that always uh, made me more curious about tiki bars was the dream. They used to sell the dream about escaping. Yeah. Today we use lots of words. We use exotic. We use tropical. Tiki is misused lots of times. How do people escape today? I mean, have we found a way that is common to lots of people to escapism, or is there lots of different variations of this theme, and we can't control it anymore today? That's a really good question, Alex, because the very notion of a mini vacation taken in a tiki bar that transports you into an immersive environment, like a little Polynesian movie set, it doesn't necessarily work in the age of the internet. It doesn't necessarily work in the age of television, internet, 
jet travel. Um, you have to remember that when Tiki was first popular from the 30s through the 50s, very few people traveled, and there was no commercial jet travel anywhere. Um, the, the closest you were going to get to Polynesia that was to go much more comfortable ones. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and if if you were the closest you were ever going to get to the South Seas was to go to a tiki bar that created that environment for you. Um, now it's different, you know. Now you can get on a South, you know, a cheap airline and go and go actually to Tahiti or go to Hawaii. Um, you can go anywhere you want in the Maldives to um, the Seychelles. Uh, it's a truly a global village now. The world is much smaller. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, if you wanted to know what other cultures were like, you had to subscribe to National Geographic, where there'd be like a few photographs. When TV started, maybe there'd be some TV program about you know, some travelogue. But people didn't have the conception they do now of. Uh, now you go to Google and you know what any place on the globe, no matter how remote, looks like. There's no mystery anymore. There's no mystery of the exotic South Seas anymore. You have to be a willing, you have to willingly suspend disbelief when you go into a tiki bar now, okay. <laughs> uh, in a much more conscious way, I think. Unless it's truly done right, uh, and people have spent a million dollars on decor just to make that movie set thing happen. Not too many bar owners can afford to do that, or would if they could. You know, so. Well, yeah. Mm. Well, let me say that this has all been your fault, you know. <laughs> At least take recognition. Guilty. Guilty, You're guilty for all this. So <laughs> everything that we see now, good or wrong, you have to take uh, part of the, of the guilt for it. Okay, I will. Okay. Where, do you, where do you see Tiki going in the best and the worst ways in the, uh, in the future? Where I see Tiki going in the best way is that the drinks keep getting better and better in the bars that are doing it right. Um, to the point that I think you can get a better Tiki drink now in more places than you could during Tiki's original golden age, where there were a lot of clones and rip-off bars that weren't doing it right. Yes, you could go to Trader Vic's or Don the Beachcomber, Tiki Tea, the Mai Kai, get a good drink, but there were a lot of places that served horrible drinks. Um, the ones I didn't put in the books <laughs> I wrote. You know, I mean, uh, out of every 300 recipes I looked at, maybe. 10%, maybe 30 of them ended up in these books. They weren't all good, um, and they weren't all done right. Um, and I think there's a higher percentage of people doing them right now because of the, co the consciousness that craft cocktail bartenders have about balance and about body and about delivering um, a worthy drink to their guests. Um, where it's going wrong is the atmosphere is being lost. Part of what made a tiki drink taste good was where you were drinking it. Um, it tastes so much better when you're drinking it in a place that has a decor and a theme that's pleasing to the eye and to the senses. Uh, and when you're drinking the drink, you're happy to be. You only want to drink it in this room. You don't want to take the recipe home and make it in your room. You want to be in the space. Um, and I think that's getting lost a lot. We talked about dive bars, the whole phenomenon of the self-conscious tiki dive bar. Well, we're going to serve tiki drinks, and some of them may be good, but we're going to do it in this dive bar, um, quote unquote, which we got cheap when the original owner went out of business, and we don't have to put any decor up because we're just calling it a dive bar. Um, doesn't work that way. Um, if you want the dive bar experience, Go to a dive bar and get a beer and a shot, a real dive bar. If you want the tea experience, I think it has to be 50% atmosphere uh, and 50% cocktail. Well, this leads me to the last question. For me, you've changed now from a writer. You're also a bar owner. You didn't say that before. You, you kept it out of, of your presentation. <laughs> right. But uh, has that changed your view in some way? on the business, on uh, the contemporary mood of Tiki Bar's clientele? I mean, what has changed in your view? How much now? time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, actually, owning a bar and being on the other side of things has completely changed the way I look at bars and, um, and the way I look at cocktails. Um, every single facet of drinking and um, being a customer has changed. Like when I opened Latitude, I had, I'd never worked as a professional bartender, but I had been a customer for f well nigh 40 years. <laughs> so I knew what I liked and what I didn't like, and that's what I tried to impart 
in my own place, just delivery experience that I would want if I walked into a bar. Um, it turned out to be easier and harder than I thought. Um, the easy part was figuring out how to adapt these recipes to you know, high volume service and get them out. Uh, not only make a good drink, but make it um, quickly and make it so that the pour cost was always 20% or less and you, would, you could stay in business. Um, all of a sudden, this hobby of mine, this thing I did for fun, turned into a job. <laughs> And of course you look at work a lot differently than you do fun. Um, now, the easy part and what makes it still fun is having a great crew. What I learned opening the bar, the biggest thing I learned um, is the value of hiring the right people. Uh, and that's the reason I could be here today across the ocean instead of at the bar trying to put out fires every five <laughs> minutes. Um, I've got a great crew, a, a bar manager who's totally dedicated and totally um, experienced and, and um, passionate about what he does. And I've got bartenders. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it must be way. very easy to find people that want to work for you. <laughs> it's, it's easy to find people who want to work for me. It's not easy to find good people. Oh, okay. and, uh, and by that, I, I don't mean good bartenders. I mean good people. I understand um, perfectly. <laughs> I can, yeah, we can teach anybody how to make a good drink. One day... Well, with a trainee on the bar, I can teach them how to make a great zombie, how to make a great Navy Grog. What I can't do is teach them how to be a good person, how to be um, a hospitable person, a, pe a person who likes people, a person who's happy, who, who, a person who derives pleasure from giving pleasure to other people. That's gold. And when you find that, you can leave them to it, um, just tell them what you want and get out of their way. <laughs> yeah, let them do their thing, and um, and that's been the most gratifying thing forever. When I'm uh, gratifying thing of all is when I'm just standing near the entrance door and watching everybody work and seeing that machine work and seeing the smiles and the and the happy people. And when I go touch tables um, and I talk to the customers and they mention bartenders by name and how wonderful they are, and you can't. I mean, that's that's as important as the drink easily and it's more important than the when, atmosphere. When clients learn the bartender's name, that's a very good uh, sign. Yes, so yes indeed. That's and it, and that there's, there's many more negative things but we'll stay out of that for <laughs> now. We'll do that tonight <laughs> when the camera's off. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Let's just do one more. The pleasure's Cheers. mine, Alex. Cheers.